finally uh, Tom is free and not running around the world. Um, so I'm very pleased to have Tom. Thank you very much. Good, you. Good morning, thank you for coming. I wanted to talk a little bit about an approach to design for construction that grows out of a concern I have for sustainability. And I've been working in this field for, for far too long. I, I once had a very head, full head of hair, but I worry so much about these things. And I think an awful lot has been written about sustainability. But at the core of it, what architects do, and there's an awful lot of weight being put on what architects do, is that we need to rethink the way in which we work. And I've called it the three L's. You, you know the three R's, you know, reuse, repair, recycle. It's the kind of motto of the recycling movement that's been so popular. This is my attempt to try and cut through a huge amount of information to make three L's. Um, sustainable design is something that everyone's talking about. There was a time when, of course, um, there is very little um, spoken about it, and it was just the, the, the purview of, of hippies and so on. What's interesting, and what I want to talk a little bit about today, is the way in which the government in particular, the federal government, is putting a huge amount of pressure on the idea of energy efficiency. So instead of changing the fuels, we're talking about making things efficient. My concern is that we're starting from a very low base. We're not actually a very energy intensive industry in Australia, in, in housing in particular, and in buildings generally. We have a very mild climate, and, um, but that's not to say that we don't have problems. Um, the background to this slide, for those of you who may not have seen it before, is one of my favourite slides of Australian suburbia. And it sums up... Well, it's exactly what it is. It, my, my, uh, my concern, I don't know if you can, if you can see it actually, really is... For me, having worked in the building industry for 30 years, in the design industry, there's no difference between the housing in the foreground and the housing in the background. Because they're actually both built the same way. They're a timber box covered with masonry all around it to give it the illusion of permanency. But we know that it's rotting from the inside. It's just that for the ones at the back, we have a name for it, brick venereal disease. So I've been trying to work out a way in which we might talk about sustainability in a way that people might break it down as a huge field. And I've had a little motto that it's made of four things, which is what Aristotle thought that the world was made from. Made from fire, water, earth, and air. They were the four basic elements. And if you look at that, it actually corresponds to the four things that most people talk about in terms of sustainability. Energy, which is really top of the pops, which most people hear about because of E2, G2, you heard that expression? Energy efficiency, greenhouse gases. E2, G2 is what the government talks about in terms of increasing energy efficiencies to reduce greenhouse gases. Water, of course, is something because we're the driest continent and, of course, the whole aspect of how we use water is incredibly important. Because we build, we're involved in more than just energy and water on its own. There's actually buildings to be built and there's a huge issue about it means is that all that equipment, all those cupboards, all the facings and so on, if you've got a kitchen that's 40 years old, think about it. It's equipment from 1970. Does the equipment still work? This is pre-microwave, which some people believe is from somewhat prehistoric to Gen Y. Does everything last? But if you go to take that kitchen out, does it involve just removing some cupboards that you can unscrew and then screwing something back in and being able to flat pack those cupboards and put them back into the recycling? Or does it mean getting machinery to pull the whole thing out and put it in a dumpster and ship it off to landfill? What happens to electrical goods? It gets even worse with bathrooms. Average life of a bathroom, 23 years. So after a while people think, oh, those tiles, I don't like those. It may not be because they don't last. It could be just they don't like the colour. I mean, Pink and black was a pretty outrageous <laughs> colour scheme. It comes so, back. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that happens is that you tend to see those things being pulled out of the house. Now, if you uh, see a typical bathroom renovation, you see walls being 
deep plaster and the wiring and the plumbing being pulled out of the brickwork. So what you're seeing is the long life structure is being attacked in order to get rid of the loose fit. So what we mean by loose fit is things like light fittings that aren't actually built into the structure. So in all of our houses, we put the light fittings in helmets that run all the way around the room. So the value of that for us is that the wiring is actually in there as well. If you want to add more security system, you want to add some more lights, you want to feed wiring to some speakers, we're giving you a little trough that runs around, if not all of the room, part of the room. So that it means that you've got this uh, structure in which you can fit uh, lines and so on underneath it. It gives it a, it, it has all sorts of energy impacts as well because it means that you fit blinds and curtains which protect from heat loss. We're also fitting things to the outside of the building which could be removed or upgraded like these, this form of shading on the outside of it. There are no eaves because the building is designed differently so you actually have purpose designed grills over the windows. A lot of the furniture that we design is built in such a way that it can actually be removed without doing damage to the main structure of the building. We build cupboards, for instance, into which we put all of the equipment so that you can actually get all the cabling at one point. So you know that you can get access to it. You don't have to start tearing plasterboard and walls apart to get access to it. Likewise, all the joinery and bathrooms is up off the floor. You actually have a way of ducting we're using commercial ducting systems in private homes. So that it, you know, because in just in the lifetime of building a home, you can find that the category of communications cable or the amount of wiring and so on completely changes. If you think what computers were like in 25 years ago, if you think that the fit out in the building is going to last 25 years, and if you admit to yourself, that this kitchen, this bathroom, this electrical installation, this plumbing installation will only last 25 years and design it accordingly. It's not a criticism of your design abilities or of your client's pocketbook. It's really an acceptance that 25 years ago, we're talking 1985, I worked on a Mac Plus computer. Remember what they were like? And the tech that's coming, it's already here. How many of you have heard of Sekasui? Okay. Um, Sekasui is the world's largest house building company. It's basically the Toyota of house construction. It's the biggest, their headquarters are 17 floors in Tokyo. They built, they just finished building their two millionth house in Japan. Two million houses in one company. They bought the rights to the use of A.V. A. Jennings' name. They bought enough land to build 5,000 houses in the next two or three years. They're all prefabricated. The factory is underway. It's being built at Minto in Sydney and in Moravan, I think it is, in Melbourne. So they're going to be prefabricated. And what that does, there's a number of things about it that I think are worth talking about in terms of long life loose fit. Firstly, the componentry is made so that you can put it together and take it apart. One of the problems in, in Japanese architecture is that houses only last eight years. Right? So there are, there's a huge churn in people actually remodeling their houses. However, this, which is known by Red in the United States, is making houses at the very high end. This, this, by the way, is houses which cost, in our terms, between $5,000 and $8,000 a square meter. They're small. But they're unbelievably beautiful. Who have they been built for? Hollywood stars in Venice, Walton, Venice, California, and Santa Monica, and so on. They churn out stuff at 4,000 a square meter. Who's this firm? Marmol Radzina. They're an architectural firm. They're Leo Marmol, Ed Radzina. They're two architects who founded their own firm. But there's, if you look up Michelle Kaufman, it's the, the, the same name as Pagro Brunts. Same thing. Yeah. The, 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 but one of the things that we're talking about here is the quality of it. Thank you. It, the, the, the quality you can get in a factory. Now, um, before everybody needs to go. 
one, the thing that addresses the talk I've been given is if you make it in a factory, you don't have a whole lot of white vans driving everywhere and unloading a whole lot of tools and plugging in and so on. And you don't have people climbing into buildings and going up scaffolding. It's people would much rather go to work in this sort of site on a day in the middle of winter when it's pissing down with rain and you want to go to work, your tools are already there. Your mates are already there, it's safe, there's a nice place to have lunch, and you're building something that's exact. Not swinging around on a ladder trying to screw something in and, and, and bodge up a job that some, somebody else didn't do properly. The quality goes up, the work, the, the workman like nature of it is such that you get a higher tolerance and you get a higher degree of quality. It's also safer, the potential for... Hmm? Waste. The waste is reduced because it's being recycled on site. The ability for you to be able to control the, uh, the changes and the design changes is much greater because it's actually done in the factory to shop drawings. Oh. And the end result is that it actually has far less impact on your neighbours. Once the slab is poured, the building appears in two to five days. They did it on Did you see that one? Hmm? When they did the half house, it was amazing. Yeah. Can components like that be stacked? In Melbourne, in uh, a little street called um, Collins Place, if you, if you just Google Collins Place, there's, there's a new um, prefabricated apartment building that's 12 storeys tall, and every apartment's been made prefabricated off site. Six months ago, there was nothing on site. They poured a slab, the car park, and they, the core, and they, put, they built four apartments a day. Who's that? Is it static? No, no, it's, it's, it's done by Fender Catsalitis. Oh. Right? And it's done out of a, firm, out of a uh, factory that Nonda owns called UB, Universal Building. UB1 is the building. UB, Universal Building 1. So it's stacked, there's apartments, and it's already there, occupied, they're living in it. Six months ago, nothing was just a car park on the side. I mean, the, what it does to the neighbours, how many people have actually struggled through somebody building a house that takes nine months? You know, we, we're building a house at the moment in a traditional manner, using project builders that we use for a lot of our work. The owners said, we have a problem because we know the neighbour will be upset. She moved into this house because she lived in Balmain. She was sick of everybody renovating around her. Right? We said, well, we can't do anything. We've told her we're going to do it. She's very disappointed. The house is for sale. Now, she's so offended by the fact that you know, the house across the road and the house next door and so on are being... She just can't live with that noise, that constant... You know, who many, how many people want to listen to Triple M at 7 o'clock in the morning other than builders? You know? <laughs> how many people want to, want to see a pile of move cartons growing ever larger in the front yard? It's not short term. Short term, sometimes houses take nine months. Typically, a project home that's built by a volume builder takes nine months to construct. Architect design houses can take up to two years. That's a long time. You know, and, and, you know, if you're, I mean, we have a problem at the moment because it's you know, the second week of October. It's HSC week. You know, who wants to be living next door you when know, you've got some fractious 18 year old that's on hormones anyway? You know, being upset by the fact that they're being woken up in the morning by the sounds of you know, rock hammers nice. and drills. <laughs> That's it, Good. Any Shut questions? <laughs> Loads of questions. Uh, I, want, I want to start, start with one question, actually. Double uh, side of question. It's about earth building around the earth. Right. We did a fantastic presentation four or five months ago, very successful. And yesterday I was talking with a presenter and I asked him to do something again. And he said, I don't want to do anything again in Sydney because. Nobody cares about that building in Sydney. And he said it's so open.